Welcome you to worship. I bring you greetings from the Oakville United Methodist Church and uh, hoping that God's faith and will be with you to get you through this time. Welcome to worship from your friend at Steamboat Island Church. Welcome to worship from your friends at First United Methodist Church of Olympia. Welcome to worship from Shelton UMC. Welcome everyone to worship service today from the Rochester United Methodist Church. Come worship with us at Tom United Methodist Church. Welcome everyone to worship led by the South Sound Church Cooperative. I'm Pastor Denise Roberts from St. Andrews United Methodist Church. And we, as part of the co-op, are so glad that you've chosen to join us today as we worship the Lord together and as we share in this time of online fellowship. As the body of Christ, we care about one another. And as pastors of the South Sound Co-op, we care about you and your family. And we're here not only to feed you spiritually, but to help in any way that we can. If you are able, I'd like to invite you to fill out one of our Connect cards so that we know that you were here. And also please, please feel free to fill out a prayer card. And let me take a moment to say, Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers, to our moms-to-be, our stepmoms, and our step-in moms. Thank you so much for all that you do to nurture and nourish the hearts and minds and bodies of our children. As we begin this time of worship, I invite us to meditate together on this scripture from Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I know that for some of you, it may be easy to think of things happening in your life that are cause to rejoice. And we as the body of Christ rejoice with you. I also know that some of you may be struggling to rejoice right now struggling to be glad and as the body of christ we share your pain we as a nation and as a world are in the midst of a pandemic that has changed our lives significantly 
many things are happening to us that get in the way of us feeling glad. And so during this time of worship for all of you listening and all of you viewing, but especially for all of you who are struggling to feel glad, struggling to feel connected, we pray that this time of worship allows you to let go of the fear, the anxiety, the sadness, the worry, and doubt, and insecurity, the loss of control, the exhaustion, the lack of forgiveness, all of those things that stand in the way of you feeling and receiving and responding to God's grace. Even if it's just for a moment, may you feel something for which to be thankful. For truly gratitude is what heals the heart. During this time of worship, may we all feel that even in these dire times, God continues to work for the good. And I pray that soon we will all be able to truthfully say, this is the day that the Lord has made for me. May I rejoice and be glad in it. Thanks be to God. As we come into this transcendent space, do not let our hearts be troubled. Just as you set aside eternal dwelling places for us, help us to see this space, this time of worship, this moment together as sacred space with you, O oh God. We come together today to give thanks and to celebrate our relationship with you, with humility and awe, thanksgiving, and bow our heads amazement. We know that being in loving relationship with you means actively giving thanks for the loving relationships you call us to with one another. And this is the good news. This is the moment in which we gather and remember what matters most, love. We come into this space believing in you, O oh loving and forgiving God. We come to as seekers, seekers who search for you, God of grace, who will fill the everyday spaces of life as we leave this time of hallowed respite at the end of the worship service. We come as troubled people knowing that now in this moment of prayer and message, gathering and giving, you call us to a space of rest, of peace, of miracle and holy power. And this morning we remember your promise that if in your name we ask for anything, you will do it. This morning we ask for sacred space. It brings its own grace and moments. We ask for the holy and life-affirming, grace-abounding moments that only you, O oh God, make manifest. And we humbly and joyfully Lift our lives to you, for you are our God, and all are your people. Let your face shine upon your servants. Save us with your steadfast love. In you we shall not be troubled. We will soar in prayer and music and message filled with your healing grace. Glory be to God. Amen. Blessed. 
Hear now God's word from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Before we begin this reading, I just ask that you take a deep breath in and let your heart center on God's word. And as we exhale, breathe out anything that is troubling our hearts and let God hold it for us. May you hear these words of scripture today and may they bring you comfort and joy. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, South Sound Co-op. I'm so glad to see all of you. I'm here with a couple of awesome co-op kids who are super helpful because I had some technical errors with our Tuesday recording and these three were ready and able to help me record uh, <clears throat> not on Tuesday, which is fantastic. So today's scripture passage where we hear this idea that God's house has many rooms. Now, I don't know how it was for, for the three of you, but the first time I heard the term God's house, I assumed that we were talking about the church building, and that was where God lived. And as I got older, I learned, well, the whole world is God's house. The whole universe is God's house. And so sometimes we when we imagine the church building as God's house or when we imagine nature, as God's house. And those are both true and real statements that God's house is both the church and nature, the whole world and the whole universe. But we don't always associate God's house with being our house, that God is in all of our homes. So I would be curious to know, Sophia, what is your favorite room in your house? My favorite room in uh, our house is uh, the living room because I have more room to dance than my bedroom. Awesome. Carter, what's your favorite room in your house? My favorite room, well, my favorite room in our house, I think, is the garage because that's where our animal, where our puppies is. Mm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Evan? What's your favorite room? Well, I'm going to change this one because I wasn't really sure. I'm going to, my favorite room is the bedroom because I love to sleep. Because you love to sleep? 
Yeah, I really like, I like the bedroom in our house also. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to, sh and the thing that's interesting about what's been happening in our world right now is that all of a sudden people are seeing into each other's homes in a way that we didn't before, right? So I've been to both of your houses, but not everybody has. And lots of people have not been to my house. And instead they see this one little square of what's going on here. But I thought I might show you all that this is what it looks like in the room that I am currently in. It's a mess. <laughs> it's just a big old mess of a room. And that's okay because it is serving a purpose for me right now, which is it's a place for me to do the work and ministry that I need to do. So as you look in that space, the reason I share that with you is because I have a feeling that lots of peace, people's houses are really messy right now. It's hard to not, it's hard to clean when you know you don't have like guests coming over, right? But here's the thing. God is in that whole mess. God's in my house mess. God is in all of your houses mess. And that is a joyful thing. God is in the living room when Sophia is dancing. God is in the garage hanging out with Carter's animals. God is in the bedroom taking a nice luxurious nap on Evan's bed. God is in all of those places. And that means that all of our homes, whether they're spotless clean or whether they're super messy, all of those places God is in and therefore all of those places are sacred and holy. And so my hope for you this week is that as you move through your house, as you go in and out of the different rooms, that you will take a moment and take a deep breath and remember that God is in this place right here with me. And what a great gift that is to all of us. So let's pray about that. And this is a repeat after me prayer. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, wherever I am, wherever I am, you are also there. You are also there. Wherever you are, wherever you are, I am there with you. I am there with you in my spirit. In my spirit, all our spirits, all our spirits are connected. Connected. Through you. Through you. Help us to notice you. Help us to notice you. In the clean. In the clean. And in the mess. And in the mess. In our dancing. In our dancing. In our resting. In our resting. In our play. In our play. And all that we do. And all that we do. Amen. Amen. Since we're still in the great 50 days of Easter, happy Easter, South Sound Cooperative. It's good to be with you, Oakville, Tumwater, Rochester, Shelton, Steamboat Island, Olympia, and St. Andrew's United Methodist Churches. Your pastors, staff, and lay leaders have done incredible work at maintaining important ministry during this devastating and uncertain time. When I hold you in my prayers, I see your churches and your faces, and I remember your ministries, and I feel at one with you. May God continue to dwell deep in your connection May Jesus continue to lead you on the path of peace. And may the Spirit continue to enliven your experience of the body of Christ. I'm wondering if you recall the transitive law from algebra. It goes, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Do you remember that? In this law, 
each letter is equal to or at one with all the other letters. Well, this is a property that I often think about when I hear sections from the Gospel of John, including our passage today. I like to think of it as John's transitive law of Jesus. God, our parent, is at one with Jesus, and Jesus is at one with us. So God, our parent, is at one with us. We hear it at the very beginning of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word became flesh and lived among us. Through the incarnation, Jesus is one with God and God is at one with Jesus and Jesus is at one with us. We also hear this sense of oneness throughout the gospel. Jesus' ministry was all about extending the invitation of being at one with him and God. He extended that invitation to Nicodemus in the middle of the night. He extended that invitation to the woman at the well. He extended that invitation to the disciples as he washed their feet. Throughout the gospel, we learn that A equals B and B equals C, and so A equals C. This oneness between God, Jesus, and humanity is a central teaching of John's theology. I argue that it's even central to our United Methodist theology. It's in our communion liturgy. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. We hear it in our Wesleyan phrase, moving onward towards perfection where we can define perfection as oneness with God and all of creation. And we even have it in the core tenets of social holiness and personal piety, which is all about drawing us closer to God and to others. Even in the midst of this pandemic, when we regularly feel isolated and disconnected, Jesus extends to us the invitation to receive and participate in the ongoing oneness that transcends physical distancing. As we respond to Jesus's invitation with open hearts and minds, we can receive deep blessings in this disorienting time. Our text today, which part of it might be familiar to you, we hear it regularly at memorial services. It's the start of Jesus's final discourse, his last extensive speech to his disciples before his death. We often hear it during the season of Easter along with the rest of the chapter where Jesus promised to send the Spirit to be with the disciples. In this final teaching, Jesus sought to encourage, reassure, and ground the disciples because things were about to drastically change. And John's transitive law of Jesus could do just that, root the disciples in troubling times. We hear this transitive law of Jesus four times in verses 9 to 11. Whoever has seen me has seen God. Do you not believe that I am in God and God is in me? Believe me that I am in God and God is in me. We also hear that this oneness encompasses the disciples four times in the first seven verses. Some of those verses are, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. If you know me, you will also know God. From now on, you know God 
and have seen God. Now here, knowing isn't intellectual, it's more heart knowing. But of course, the disciples struggle to understand what Jesus truly means. Jesus used an image to describe this oneness to help the disciples understand. The image of God's big house, where there's room enough for all to live, including the disciples. A place where Jesus has prepared a special place just for them so the disciples could live there with him. Jesus even told the disciples they already know how to get to the house. The disciples thought Jesus meant a physical place and a route to get there. Where is this house? We don't know. How could we? Can you show us how to get there? But the house isn't a place, and the way isn't a route with Google Map and instructions. The house, the way, the knowledge instead are a state of being, being at one with, dwelling with God, Jesus, and humanity. From the beginning of the gospel, John has been leading us to this core theology. And Jesus tried to root the disciples in this oneness before his death. Even though he would no longer be with them physically, they would still be at one with him, just in a different way. There's no place, no formula, no route. There's only dwelling with Jesus. That spiritual dwelling place of oneness is where contentment, transformation, peace, courage, hope, patience, steadfast love and grace can be found. It's certainly the place where the self-giving common good actions of the early church that Pastor Amanda talked about last week originated. The good news today is that Jesus extends that invitation of oneness to us as well. We too can dwell with God, Jesus, and the world even in the midst of disorienting and devastating times. And that dwelling can lead us as well to self-giving, common good, kingdom-creating actions. What could be better than when we are under stay-at-home orders to practice Jesus's spiritual stay-at-home orders, to dwell with, to be at one with the source of our being, and one another? We don't have to go to our church building to know and feel connected to God. We don't have to meet in person to know and feel connected to one another. We might prefer it. We might receive particular gifts from it, but it isn't necessary. Like the monastic father Sisoeth said, seek God and not where God lives. We have the unique opportunity right now to really, really let that seep into our bones, our spirit, to let it shape us as individuals and as a community, to let it affect what we say and what we do. We can take our pandemic troubled hearts our fear, worry, anxiety, our irritation, grief, and weariness to God, to let it be wrapped in the healing and loving grace of God. There we can examine those things without judgment, and we can let go. There we can cultivate space that seeks the beauty and goodness around us. We can wrestle with Jesus's call for the common good. 
and we can follow the spirit's beckoning to new ways of being the body of Christ in the world. There are many ways that we can be at one with God and the world right now. And in a bit, I've asked your pastors to share um, an idea or a way that you are already doing this. But just like the disciples, there's a lot that we can miss, that we cannot understand or that can stand in our way of Jesus's invitation. Right now, some of us struggle with the anxiety, anger, and the constriction that we feel at the lack of control we have. Jesus invites us to dwell with God, to take our frustrations to God and let God work on them. What about this time leaves you feeling frustrated? Why does the dependence upon the common good upset you? What could help you let go so that you can give yourself more freely to the kingdom? Right now, some of us struggle with grief. Jesus invites us to dwell in his healing presence, to honor your grief. Light a candle, be gentle, and see what the grief can transform into. Right now, there are some of us who don't know anyone who has been deeply affected by this pandemic. And Jesus invites us to dwell with the world to listen to or read stories about people who have lost a loved one or of those on the front lines or of folks in the African-American community who are being disproportionately affected or our Asian-American siblings who have faced racist words and actions. Dwell and let compassion stir within you. And right now, some of us are struggling with having enough to eat or are putting ourselves in harm's way with work when we'd prefer to just stay home. Jesus invites us to dwell with him, the one who speaks deep blessing and peace to those on the edges. Each day we can experience oneness. We can deeply know God's grace and feel deep connection. We can be like the disciples who responded to Jesus's invitation by starting a movement for the common good. What could happen if we all gave ourselves to the practice of oneness? What idea for the world might be birthed in you? What act of compassion for your neighbors might you participate in? What old ways of being might you be ready to let go of that you never thought you'd let go of so that you could give yourself and your resources in a new way to the kingdom of God. When we open ourselves up to the Spirit's movement, anything can happen, even during a pandemic. May it be so. Amen. So I think this is where I get to share and say thank you, Kathleen, for a powerful, powerful word. Um, it occurs to me that when we think about being part of the common good, we, we tend sometimes to make the common a lot smaller than it is. And we think mostly of ourselves and people like ourselves and the things that we're doing. I am so proud of the congregation I serve because I've recognized in the years I've been here that they're not just about the work we do at the church, but every single one of them seems to be doing something in the community. And I'm excited about that. 
This week we had an interesting thing happen, a scary thing. We had a member of the church fall and break several bones. And uh, within just a few hours of her request for some help, um, we had a ramp built into her house so that when she gets home in a week or so, she'll be able to navigate that with a wheelchair. And, and dozens of other people in the church stepped up and said, we'll bring meals and we will uh, spend time with her in her home, spending the nights, uh, making sure that her needs are being met while she's severely limited. Um, that you almost expect that kind of thing from a church. We take care of our own. The real challenge is to say, how do we care for the people beyond the walls of the church? How do we make the common good uh, bigger than our common good? You know what I'm saying here? That to Take that out into the world. Before this crisis started, uh, we were just beginning the process of putting together an inventory of such sorts um, where we would look at all the different ways that people in the church are volunteering in the community. We want to recognize that uh, the work of the church is not the only place where good things are happening. And uh, so we celebrate that. I, I think one of the things that I want to see us do moving forward in um, working with the common good is to recognize that when we're motivated to volunteer in the world because of our faith in God, that we are powerfully witnessing to God's love in a way that words will seldom rival. Actions always speak louder than words, right? I think the church needs to celebrate our ability to be a clearinghouse of sorts, a clearinghouse of helping hands that are reaching out to the world by helping others help others. Um, that would be my hope as we look forward to the future, that we not think that we have to do it all, but let's do what we do well, and let's encourage one another to connect with people who might be a little different than us, worshiping God in different ways, or maybe not worshiping God at all, but recognizing that God is at work in them. At one meant doesn't mean that God is only at one with us, at one with all. Thanks, Kathleen, for the good word. I have been amazed uh, at both the churches that I serve, Rochester and Oakville, of how people can shift Years. And what I mean by that is uh, we have had um, meal programs at both churches for some time now. And when the closures happened and we could no longer gather in the way that we had before, um, both churches uh, found ways to do takeout meals. Um, uh, we also actually have a delivery service in, in Oakville where, where we have a couple of folks um, who are called the soup ladies and they bring meals. And so it's been wonderful to see people recalibrate. Even though we'd done a certain thing a certain way for so long, there was a way to shift and do it differently. And I have been thinking about what next, what, what else might we do, especially in the context of where we've been in the closure, in having difficulty accessing food, in finding, um, just finding things um, that we need but aren't so easy to access. And I really have this deep, deep sense that has to do with being one and being interconnected uh, at both churches. And, and it is this, the food that we have been providing for some time is, is just so vital. But the thing is, we also sit on pretty good uh, pieces of land that are just sitting there and they could be dug up and they could be cultivated. And perhaps if they had a pastor who was a crazy gardener, oh yeah, that's me. We could grow things and our young people in the community could come and learn how to do that. We have people in our churches who are expert sewers, not just of gardens, but uh, make quilts and they know how to sew things. And we could share that knowledge with our young people. We can, we can learn how to cook our food and the food and the, and the things that we grow can be used in our, in our food programs. There's just so much that we could be doing in an interconnected way, in a joyful life affirming way, um, in a way that helps us be self-sufficient in times of difficulty, but also getting to that 
self-sufficiency together and learning how to be uh, together in, in doing that. So I suspect that when um, uh, we all get back, um, and I hope that soon, um, I'll have some plans for digging up some property, planting some crops, uh, and, and trying some new old things, new old things um, that feed in so many ways. So many ways. Thank you, Kathleen. It was a wonderful message. And um, we are so much better and stronger together in this co-op, but also um, in our communities where our churches are um, in the, in, within the walls of the church, but so profoundly outside in our neighborhoods. So I'm excited about what might be possible next. Kathleen, I, I also um, extend my gratitude for your wonderful message. Your message about what it is to be at one and what it is to witness, what it is to serve. And I was reflecting just this past week at our church, um, St. Andrews, uh, one of the base narratives of our church, which has only been around 60 years, but one of the deep narratives when we tell stories about ourselves very often, those stories are about feeding others. And so it really is no surprise that just a few days ago, we uh, at St. Andrews sponsored a drive-through food drop-off in support of the food bank. As you can imagine, with so many people out of work now, the food bank is deeply in need of replenishing their shelves. Um, the, the number of people accessing the food bank now versus just a few months ago, it's just blossomed exponentially and it's been a challenge for the food bank to keep up. And that's, that's a calling to us at St. Andrews. That's a calling to us to help where we can. Um, and we know, we know that many of the people that are going to the food bank now are our neighbors, our friends, sometimes even our families. And so for a few hours last Thursday, we invited the church and the community to a drive-by with food and toiletries. We gave instructions for the people to place the items in their, the trunk of their car or their hatchback. And when they got to the church, all they had to do was unlatch the hatchback or trunk, which they did from the safety of their car. And our folks removed the bags or the boxes and everything was done with an eye towards safety. And of course, there was a lot of chatting. People rolled down windows and kept their mask on. And, and uh, greeted people that we haven't seen in a while. And while we were very thankful for all of the gifts that we received and the time to spend with our friends and other church members, the really good news is that this was a day of blessings. God has told us that we are blessed so that we might be a blessing to others. So what we have has not been given to us because of some special privilege but for special service. And that service is to help others in need. And so for those of us who look to the Bible for our guidance in terms of how we lead our lives, may we enjoy God's blessings. And then, and then may we share those blessings, may we pass them on whenever and where are, wherever they're needed through God's people all the communities across our country, all of the nations of the earth, may we pass on the blessings that we have so that all of the earth might be blessed in God's name. May it be so. Amen. Thank you for, uh, for the good word and for reminding us all of eighth grade math uh, today. I think one of the things that is actually helpful about that is the way that uh, many, many people, um, you know, struggled with those ideas of mathematics or some, some different framework for seeing the world. And that is what Jesus is inviting us into in discipleship, a fundamentally different way of seeing the world, a different way of being in the world. And 
at Shelton UMC, it's been so beautiful to see the ways in which uh, people have been expanding and deepening their connections with one another through uh, a calling and care ministry, through the continuation of prayer and uh, the occasional field trip just to go celebrate and wave and honk at someone's house. It is important for us to stay connected and to go deep in our oneness with God, with Christ, and to listen carefully for the Spirit. All of us are in different places with different gifts in this journey. And I'm so inspired by uh, the other congregations in our co-op and the hands-on things that they're doing. And also we know that not everyone can participate safely in those things. And so it's also good to remember that part of our power and calling as God's people, as the church, is to be fiercely, deeply, spiritually grounded and strong in this time. And I wonder if choosing for ourselves a small rule of life, uh, making a commitment to a daily prayer practice if you have not already. Perhaps uh, if you're interested in uh, an online new small group that is about really taking seriously how God is forming us in this time so that we can be grace-filled, disciples for our communities. But that work is not easy work either. And so I just uh, invite all of us to, to listen for the Spirit, for the way that God is calling you, particularly you, uh, to respond and to be formed more and more into the likeness of Christ. Thank you, Kathleen, for that reflection on at oneness. While you were speaking, I'm sitting out on my deck and I'm hearing all the noises of my neighborhood. Uh, my neighbor's dog Tucker was barking and some trucks were passing by. And it was a reminder to me that we, um, we are at one in many ways with the people who live in close proximity to us. We share uh, similar experiences just by living near each other. And in this time of uh, pandemic, I have noticed how we are opening up to share with each other in different ways. I have seen flour exchanged, yeast exchanged, toilet paper, Kleenex, uh, words of encouragement, um, ideas for homeschooling, uh, plant starts, uh, eggs from chickens, uh, many things shared from neighbor to neighbor. Uh, one neighbor and I were joking that we would run out of Kleenex together um, and then we would just wipe our nose on our sleeves and we would be at one uh, in in sort of that uh, that miserableness of, of not having Kleenex, um, but that we committed to each other that neither one of us would hold on to Kleenex if the other was without. Um, and at oneness is not just um, at oneness is not just about agreeing to celebrate with each other, but it's also agreeing that we will walk with each other um, and that we won't count ourselves better than another. And I have witnessed people taking that very seriously during this time of pandemic of standing together. And I want to encourage that we continue to share with our neighbors. Um, we think about what we might have to offer and we be generous with that. But along with that, I want us to also think about what it means to be at one with the people that we may not see every day in our neighborhoods. Out in the Steamboat Island area, we don't see a lot of uh, people who don't have homes or shelter. And it would be easy to forget 
to be at one with them as well. But I have been so proud of the Steamboat Island Church that has embraced a local homeless shelter. We've provided over a hundred masks for the people who call that their home. We have continued to provide meals. We have offered financial support. We have listened to the needs of that community and responded by sharing what we have to give. And so when we think about at oneness, I encourage us not just to think about the people that are in our close proximity that we can see, but those people that God might be putting on our hearts that require us to stretch a little bit um, and to maybe be made uncomfortable in order to be at one with them, to walk alongside them. And then to embrace that um, as we come alongside our neighbors, those who live next to us and those who might, um, who might be a little bit further away, that we find opportunities in the building of those relationships to be at one with each other and at one with God. Kathleen, I want to add my thanks for your good words this morning. Your math lesson reminds me of um, how we can um, use that concept of multi to multiply our blessings. And at Tumwater, um, we are realizing that although we cannot gather physically, we are doing our best to be the presence of God and through God, the presence of faith and hope to our neighborhood. We are doing this through um, maintaining and cultivating our grounds, our gardens, our playground, and offering devotion books on a table outside the door. I'm offering a place to contribute to the food bank and also offering a place to offer up prayer. Um, as summer comes on and we continue to socially isolate, I envision us perhaps having a sharing table outside our front door as well. A place where our folks can share their homegrown flowers or their tomatoes or their cucumbers or even their kiwi. We have a fellow that grows kiwi. Um, and whatever their resources are, whatever it is that they want to share. Um, we have, I think, a congregation who cares and embraces the needs of others. Um, I invite us as a congregation and as a co-op to be intentional about um, bringing and supporting healthy and holy uh, living through just the nurturing of our body, mind, and soul, and spirit. And I invite us to embrace that through whatever we can to nurture our neighbors and help them through this time of pandemic as we all um, kind of go through this together. We are the body of Christ. Amen. Well, friends, this brings us to a time of prayer. And I don't need to remind you, I don't think, that uh, prayer is a really important part of our walk with God. Um, we aren't simply telling God our worries and concerns and our needs. We're letting God in this time of prayer tell us who we are and what we're about, reminding ourselves of the very best that God calls us to be. So I want to encourage you all to um, let your pastors and your church offices know about your prayer concerns whenever you have them. Our churches, every single one of them, has some form of prayer ministry with folks who feel called to share the burden and joy of praying regularly for one another and for our world. When you share a prayer that's on your heart with your pastor or your church office and you give us permission to do so, your prayer will be shared widely. And by sharing the burdens and joys of our lives, the church grows closer together, bound up in the common experiences of this life of ours. We do not rejoice alone. We do not mourn alone. We do not worry alone, nor do we witness to our faith alone. We are bound to one another, and prayer is a strong strand that binds us. We also would love for you to join the South Sound Cooperative Morning Prayer Fellowship. We share a devotional and a time of prayer for 30 to 40 minutes each Monday through Saturday morning at 9 o'clock via a Zoom meeting. 
And friends, if you've never done Zoom, you only have to learn once because you can bookmark the address for that meeting and then it's there whenever you want it just by clicking on it. You can be there in that room of prayer. This morning I'm going to be lifting up prayer concerns that are on my heart, some of which have come through our conversations at morning prayer, and some of which come from news of the world, and some of which come from the call of God that each and every one of us hears in the scriptures, the call to love one another. At the conclusion of each petition or affirmation, I will say, To you, O God, we open our hearts, and your response aloud, wherever you are, can be, Lord, hear our prayer. So will you pray with me now? God of infinite power, infinite love, infinite life, we draw near to you in these moments of prayer, so very aware of our finiteness that is embraced by your infinite presence. We come with a beginning and an ending to a God who transcends every beginning and every ending. We come with fears and longings before our God who says, Do not be afraid, do not be anxious. We come with all of our vast potential and all of our many broken places to a God who says, Behold, all things are good, and behold, I make all things new. We wonder in your presence, O God. We rejoice in it. We tremble as we contemplate you in the world in the people around us, and even in us. May we be worthy of the high calling of being children of God. To you, O oh God, we open our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. God, we turn to you in these troubling current times so full of uncertainty, and we bring to you all of our many feelings from our fear to our sadness, from our grief to our anger, from our hopes to our longings, from our newfound strengths to our long-held weaknesses. Sometimes we think we have it all together. And then other days, oh God, we just fall apart. We do not know what the future holds from day to day, from week to week, or month to month, even year to year. We do not know. And the unknowing drains us so often of our strength. So we turn to you, O oh God. Help us to turn to you in these times of uncertainty so that we may find in you strength and reassurance and direction. To you, O oh God, we open our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh God, we pray for one another. We pray for those who mourn the loss of loved ones in these days. We know some who have died expected deaths, having lived long, rich, full lives, having shared their love widely, and we are saddened that we cannot gather now to say goodbye as we have for so many who have gone before. Still others, O oh God, have died unexpectedly, and the surprising news of their passing leaves a void in our hearts today. We pray especially for those families who have been touched with a death caused by this virus. Lord, we cannot imagine the sense of unfairness that so many must be feeling when the life of a loved one is cut short by this mysterious ailment that none of us had heard of five months ago. We pray with those who mourn. To you, O oh God, we open our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. God, we pray for those who are despairing, despondent, and depressed. We pray for those who have taken their lives or attempted to take their lives in the midst of such sense of hopelessness. We pray for the families of all who have been racked by the deaths of despair that we're reading about, that we know about from our circles of friends and family. We pray that all who wonder if life is still livable will somehow experience the reassurance of love overflowing, overwhelming, overarching. Give them that reassurance, O oh God. To you we open our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. 
God, we pray for those who are beside themselves today with worry related to the economic fallout of this crisis. For those who are worried about rent, about food, about providing for their children. And we pray for leaders of nation and state to find ways to cast a social safety net that allows no one to fall. We pray that we might find ways as people of faith to provide for those in great need today. To you, O oh God, we open our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray from the depths of our being to be people of hope in hard times. May we be ones who hear the promises of God and believe, who order our lives in such a way that the promises become realities for ourselves and for others. God, give us eyes to see the beauty of the world, beauty that is always around us. And give us ears to listen for words from you, O God, words being both whispered and shouted to us. Give us hands that reach out to help, to heal, and to hold on to the story of a God who dwells in our midst. To you, O God, we open our hearts. Lord, hear our prayers. God, we pray for the leaders of our cities, our states, our nation, and of the world. In this crisis, may we learn to live more lovingly with one another, to break down every historic wall of division, to embrace, embrace the stranger as though sister or brother or parent or child. And may our churches, may all of our churches, be places of welcome and refuge to all people. To you, O oh God, we open our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. We are imperfect people who live very much within imperfect structures, and yet we strive for perfection in love. Sanctify us, Lord, from small to great. Sanctify us, perfect us in love. Make us impatient with justice delayed, and turn our timid words into timeless testimony of the servants of God down through the ages. May we be prophetic and may we proudly and purposely stand with the great cloud of witnesses that calls all people to be God's people, to live holy and righteous lives of love and justice. To you, O oh God, we open our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. And now, Creator God, as we dwell in silence for just a few moments, Hear the prayers that each of us brings before you this day. To you, O oh God, we open our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. And let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I believe that God is doing a new thing. Every minute of every day, God is at work around us and within us. I'm seeing it in the midst of a pandemic. People are re-engaging family and friends. Neighbors are waving to one another. We are finding a new spirituality in the sometimes still moments of our homes. God is making all things new, giving and giving and giving again. And God calls us to do our part, to do what we can to support and nurture whole and holy lives, to lay a foundation of love of God and love of neighbor through the work of our churches in the community, to enable churches and congregations to be the spiritual life-giving center of neighborhoods and households. In addition to weekly online worship, our United Methodist churches are contributing to our community programs 
that provide food and shelter and transportation and nurturing. And we are actively engaging in prayer and spiritual development, even as we maintain a physical distance. We are called to be a part of God's work of generosity, to give back a portion of what God has provided. And you can contribute to God's good work through an online contribution. Many of our churches have online giving through their own websites, or you can give online to any of our churches through the portal that the First United Methodist Church of Olympia has set up. Simply go to www.fumcoly.org and select the Give tab on the right side of the page, and you will be able to select the church to which you want to give at that site. You can also mail a check to your desired church. Just go to each church's website to find their mailing address. Or you can set up regular giving through your bank or credit union's bill pay function. But however you give and whatever you give, know that your gifts are prayed over and used with the utmost consideration of the needs of the church and the community and the world. We now give space for the morning offering to commence. Loving God, bless this offering to bring about renewal to our world. And with these gifts, we pray that mourning and crying and pain will be no more. And with our hands and feet, help us make a world where justice and compassion are born, where they are the norm and where a world 
is everywhere is a good world where everyone has food and clean water and health care and shelter and spiritual nourishment. May we know hope and joy through our faith and trust in the saving grace that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. And the people of God said, Amen. Children of God, may the Holy Spirit empower you to go and serve with compassion and love. Go now and be the church. Amen. Yikes. Oh man, that was horrendous. <laughs>